So without further ado, let me introduce our next speaker, uh, Distinguished Professor Peter McNeil, FAHA, is an award-winning design historian, internationally known for his work on the visual culture of fashion. He is a fellow of the Australian Academy of the Humanities and runs its art section. His interdisciplinary research examines the past, present, and future of critical fashion, as well as other aspects of design with a focus on identities and material culture from the 18th century to the present day. For a decade, he was Foundation Professor of Fashion Studies at Stockholm University, where he worked to establish the dignity of the topic in the European university system. More recently, he was an Academy of Finland Distinguished Professor, Aalto University, for Costume Methodologies. His many publications include the award-winning The Fashion History Reader, Global Perspectives, published in 2010, um, fashion Writing and Criticism and Fashion Journalism, published in 2018. His monograph, Pretty Gentlemen, Macaroni Men in 18th Century Fashion Worlds, was published by Yale University Press in 2018. McNeil has curated and written for exhibitions with the Sydney Jewish Museum and LACMA, Los Angeles County Museum of Art. He is currently preparing a study on the rise of fashion image, 1750 to today. Um, McNeil was awarded the UTS Human Rights Award in 2018 for his work on visual culture and the LGBTQI communities. And today he will be speaking about the research and the work for his um, most recently published book, uh, Pretty Gentlemen, Macaroni Men and the 18th Century Fashion World. We are pleased to have him from Australia. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Thank you such, so much, Maud and Sophie, for this invitation to the Bard. We'll, the, we'll do some close looking today at the macaroni. Uh, here we're looking at a, a pair of spectacles uh, that can be closed very tight and not interrupt the, the line of the, of the knee breeches. Uh, a pair from about 1810, but painted in, in, in 1770. So the, the macaroni generates a lot of bemused puzzlement when his name is mentioned today. He's a little bit slippery, like the pasta that his name connotes. But this term macaroni was once widely recognized in everyday life, just as the word punk or perhaps hipster is now. He was eclipsed by the fame of the masculine Regency buck and the swells. And um, he was not embodied embedded so much in tumultuous political events as was the Anquab of post-revolutionary Paris, the figure that uh, Anne was just speaking about. So although many people today will say, oh, aha, a dandy, when they hear his name, his ethos and his appearance were very, very different from that Promethean figure. And the fact that people tend to collapse all these types of extreme men's fashions, like macaroni, like like dandy, like Anquab, into the one type, is a good example of the way people um, refuse to believe that there are very distinctive male fashion moments. So the, the study that I published mid last year, uh, which is called Pretty Gentlemen, Macaroni Men and the 18th Century Fashion World, is on one level a study of men and their sartorial fashions, but it's also a, a social, sexual and more general cultural history for, since for a period of 30 years, macaroni was a highly topical term. It yielded a complex set of meanings and associations. It could mean either fine or ultra fashionable dressing, but it was not a static fashion mo movement with simply one form. Macaroni men tended to dress in a manner that asserted a cosmopolitan fashion centric outlook. They were desirous of the rich and colorful textiles that countries such as France and Italy were renowned for, and their attitude towards fashion was exclusive and not always democratic. Many macaroni men preferred to wear the tightly cut suit, or habit la Française, that derived from French court society, 
which also became, of course, a type of transnational and up-to-date fashion for many European men at this time. So, for example, the Swedish courtiers rushed to get out of their imposed national dress and into the modern French suit as soon as they could when they were travelling. Such clothing and the accessories expected to accompany it were expensive and unsuitable for many forms of work. Yet it was possible to copy aspects of the macaroni look, particularly the hairstyle, and it seems many did so, including young men from the countryside. Macaroni men were connected to new ideas about masculine self-presentation, selfhood, and celebrity in late 18th century England. It was not just for members of the aristocracy and gentry, but men of the artisan, artists and upper servant classes wore versions of this visually lavish clothing with a distinctive cut, shorter jackets, very tight sleeves. Wealthier shopkeepers and entrepreneurs also sometimes wore lavish clothing, particularly those associated with the London luxury trades. And uh, it wasn't a, a peripheral or um, marginal um, taste at all. Uh, there are lots of really important men who were considered macaroni in their day. So therefore, in the study, it's possible to map what clothing possibly meant for men at different stages of their social, cultural, working and political lives. So I'll just give you a few examples of some of these famous figures from the past. Many of them will be well known to you. Macaroni status was attributed to figures, oh, that's, a, that's an image of um, the erotics of um, clothing and dressing in, 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 in um, uh, 18th century London. Macaroni status was attributed to, to figures including the Whig politician Charles James Fox, who was known as the original Macaroni, uh, the botanist and explorer Sir Joseph Banks. Uh, this, is, this image on the left I found in the Lewis Walpole Library in farming to Connecticut. I don't think it had been reproduced before. Um, I found that in a folio of work in that fantastic repository. And on the right, we see an image of Joseph Banks in old age in a beautiful George Dance um, drawing, which is in the National Library of Australia. You can see that in old age, Banks has retained his youthful hairstyle. Banks had been uh, satirized as the fly catching macaroni on the left here for his uh, voyages from pole to pole in, in both um, the Arctic, but also um, in, in the South Pacific. And in fact, some of Banks' wardrobe was stolen in, in what is known as modern day Tahiti. So indigenous peoples made off with his white satin waistcoat, which is quite astonishing to think about. On the right is a, a caricature of um, uh, Salander, uh, the, the famous um, Dane, a Swede, I should say. Uh, the, the renowned miniature painter Richard Cosway was a celebrated macaroni. Uh, he, he was, he's a very interesting figure because he was um, born to very modest circumstances and became incredibly wealthy from his successful uh, painting practice. He was very anxious about being called a macaroni. And um, this is something else I discovered in my research is that men seem to behave differently to accusations of too much fashion in their lives, depending on the kind of security of their social standing and their, their social status. This is a beautiful work, which is in the, in the Met, which I was lucky to look at about 20 years ago. Wonderful moment in that beautiful gold, solid gold frame. Uh, the famed landscape designer Humphrey Repton was described as macaroni in his youth. The St. Martin's Lane luxury upholsterer, John Cobb. Uh, there was a, uh, Julius Subis, who was the freed slave of the Duchess of Queensbury. He was known as the Mungo Macaroni, which is a, a negative way to describe a man of colour. And he drove around London in a, in a horse and carriage, very much on display, later starting a riding school in Bengal. We also have the case of the first white collar criminal, the Reverend William Dodd, the extravagant, extravagantly dressed chaplain to George III, who was put to death uh, for a type of fraud. Uh, he was known for reeking of perfume and giving very exciting sermons that uh, fashionable ladies couldn't wait to hear in London. So the macaroni, uh, macaroni moment, which lasts quite some time, about 25 years, two decades, it 
the interest in it was very much amplified by the great expansion of printed sat satirical caricatures that took place at exactly the same time um, and, and in which the macaroni phenomenon formed a very big topic. There was a repetition of certain motifs within these caricatures, uh, a very high hairstyle, a tiny hat. You can see one here with, this is a caricature of, of Cosway the macaroni painter or Billy Dimple sitting for his picture. Um, a tiny hat, a cane and sword, spying glasses, high-heeled shoes in a slipper-like manner, and use of a snuff box. And all of these objects had a very powerful charge for the male participants in this type of dressing. Was it all a case of too much money? Uh, macaronis flourished in the years between the two great wars of the 18th century. The first is the end of the period of the Seven Years' War, which ends in 1763. This is a point at which many young, well-to-do men rushed to the continent to see what was going on with French and Italian fashion that they had so missed during wartime. And the, the Seven Years' War saw a, a, a type of ascendancy for Britain, hence the even greater strong significance of clothing styles adopted at a time of national confidence. And then the, the macaroni moment kind of ends with the American revolutionary and Napoleonic wars that reshape borders and colonies. And that marks the kind of conclusion of the period under consideration. Of course, the term macaroni is known in everybody's sub subconscious because it's uh, part of the joke of Yankee Doodle came to town. Well, there, there are other issues we can think about for understanding the significance of men's fashion. Some of these acquisitions were status conscious purchases to signal cosmopolitanism and success. And then there are others that were possibly crafted by female relatives and lovers, and therefore might inscribe chains of attachment and sometimes also eroticism. So for example, 18th century women often worked waistcoats and made sword knots for their husband, particularly at their marriage. And this was a custom that was more explicit for the aristocracy in France. There was therefore a personal charge to many aspects of gift exchange and the making of dress fashions. Uh, this, this thing about making clothes, making embroidery, making things was transferred in a homophobic manner to a group of queer embroiderers described in a scurrilous pamphlet mocking such men who dared to knot and tat and, and embroider, which was called The Pretty Gentleman, 1747, from which my book took its title. So most fundamental to the general look of the macaroni was the hairstyle. And Anne has talked about the significance of the hair of hair for embodiment in the past. Um, hair is a very interesting um, topic because uh, as well as being about embodiment, it's also something that can be uh, modified with relative ease. Uh, fashionable men in the 60s and 70s replaced the small scratch wig of the older generation a uh, prosthetic which supplemented the natural hair and was often worn for riding with much more elaborate hairstyles that matched the towering heights of the contemporary female coiffure. For men, a very tall toupee rising in front and a thick club of hair behind required extensive dressing with pomade and white powder. Other wigs had long and thin tails looking rather like horses. Wigs became a widespread fashion item able to be copied by men up from the country and barbers and hairdressers were common even in the most rural areas of England and France. The new fashionable macaroni queue of hair was held in a large black satin wig bag, often trimmed with a rosette, which was there to protect the back of the jacket. This wig bag was re required for attending court and therefore became striking when worn in the street and in everyday life. It also added an extra expense to the men's wardrobe. Account books of the time indicate that wig bags wore out quite quickly and had to be replaced several times a year. The effect of hair, of the high hair, could be copied with real and partial wigging, and many men wore a mixture of their own hair plus some wigging. So this macaroni big hair silhouette uh, dominates the fashion ideal of many men of the period, and it's a signature of the notable portraiture associated with the most important artists of the time, including Reynolds, Gainsborough, Batoni, and Cosway. So management of the hair, management of the self, very, very important for um, 
thinking about what these what these fashions entailed. Here we see some some of the devices that are used to create the um, the big hair and the powdered hair. On the left is a very nice representation of a macaroni because it's respectful, not not scurrilous. And partly what my work looks at is how we can look at something that's satirized or caricatured and um, and then uh, working with more respectful images as well. On the right, uh, up the top is a Swedish 18th century powder bellows, which is in the Nordiska Museet. And below is a powder and carrot in the Martin Karma collection, in which you shoot like this, like an old fashioned insect spray, if you had them in the United States in the interwar years, to, to direct the powder very precisely onto the parts of the wig. And you can see that very clearly in lots of caricatures of the period. Because I'm showing you two images, one from a museum, one from a private collection, I should um, just make a very quick comment that uh, my training is uh, I'm an art historian, um, but I've been very fortunate uh, to have had several fellowships where I could look very closely at material culture. I was a Jervis Fellow at the Royal Ontario Museum about 20 years ago, where I just looked at 18th century waistcoats for one month. You know, I was given a big room, quite great, quite large, about half the size of this, and everything was on a tray with the white drop sheets, and I was just allowed in there for a month. So you really get to feel the weightiness and the feel and the texture of waistcoats from diff different times and periods. Then I also a very big believer in the materiality of print. We can't just look at prints on the screen in reproductions. We have to look at the prints, the context in which they sit, how they interact with other prints. And uh, the Lewis Walpole Library in um, Farmington, Connecticut, is a place that's very dear to me where I've spent some time. Then um, dealers and collectors like Martin Karmer of New York and Switzerland and T.B. Harler, uh, Michelle Major has helped a lot too, of Cora Ginsburg, New York, have always been very generous in letting me look at garments from the past. And I think this is the kind of thing that um, is invaluable because it, material handling um, changes the way you think about uh, fashion and materiality um, completely. Even the smell of the garments from the past is, is quite powerful and, and stays with anyone who's been in a museum storage room. So the, the macaroni, uh, they, they depart a little bit from the kind of trembling erotics of Rococo taste in that they preferred symmetry. They had new textile preferences, which were often um, uh, popular in their dressing. They prefer spotted or thinly striped textiles, they move away from the very large meandering patterns and brocades characteristic of earlier periods. And they're often even, they enjoy a symmetry where they often balance pocket watches which hang from the waistcoat with a bunch of seals on one side. We see some macaroni chatelain here, it's a wonderful form of male jewellery. Here's an example that belonged to Maria Callas, which came from the auction rooms in recent years. So they often balance the pocket watch with a, a, a first first monster dummy watch on one side. So the clothing mirrored developments in architecture and interior design where an elite interior often included false doors to achieve symmetry in interior architecture. Here we see some new materials that also set new fashion trends. Um, in the 17th, late 1760s and 70s, something called the jockey style began to emerge. Jockey caps for men that come from riding but also things like printed cotton waistcoats, which created new fashions for men, uh, cheaper simulations of ribbons and trimmings, and that must have also felt very different, being soft, pliable, and easily washed. This is an example from LACMA. By the 70s, the fashion was for the new material of steel rather than silver, including buttons. And this is a really fantastic sword knot uh, believed to be by the workshop of Matthew Bolton. Quite spectacular to believe this is stainless steel, not textile. Stainless steel shoe buckles, um, buttons made of all sorts of materialities with pastes and um, simulated materials. And this is a, a table snuff box, but it gives you an indication of the love of shades of pea green and pink which mirror exactly the contemporary architecture of Robert Adam, who was often criticised by, by co uh, commentators at the time. For example, Walpole described Adam's architecture as looking like sippets of em embroidery. Uh, I'll just um, show you an example of how the images travel a little bit across time and media. 
Um, these images were not just seen in England. They were very popular across Europe. Uh, this particular print by Matthew Darley, Ridiculous Taste or Ladies' Absurdity, was extremely popular, dates from 1771, and it probably represents um, a husband working on a woman's hair style, but of course the, figures, the figure also refers to South Sea botanist Joseph Banks using the septant for celestial navigation. Um, you can also see that uh, there's reference here to uh, it, Thomas Patch's painted caricatures of an Italian gallery with the Medici Venus, in which the painter himself, dressed in seaman's trousers, scales a classical statue and uses dividers to measure its proportions. So these kind of grand tour painted caricatures were, were very much about also asserting the self-assurance of the arrogant and the well-to-do. But the um, ridiculous taste passed through lots of iterations and, and versions. Um, I was part of a research project in Sweden in the last couple of years with Dr. Patrick Stan, and we discovered that um, this is a paint, a type of sign painting from Lund in the middle, and uh, embroidery discovered at auction in Bukowski's in the 1890s. It could, you know, could date from any time. It probably early 19th century. The image appeared in, on a painted tray by Maria Berg, possibly used for uh, performances of sociability as people enjoyed coffee or chocolate. And uh, Patrick discovered that, in fact, the very first image ever, you, ever printed in a Swedish newspaper, uh, 1779, Stockholm's Posten, was after the original, English original, but not naming Dali. And uh, Stan believes that this is connected to an editorial by the editor, Johann Holmberg, who defended the rights of the authors of texts and images to re remain anonymous by discussing the necessity of satire, for example, of a women's of women's fashion exuberance. So lots of um, caricature images travelled across different kind of media and formats. Um, those of you who know the Met Collection well will also know that it, there's a big production in Lud Ludwigsburg, um, Germany, of fine quality Paulson, Paulson figure groups, which have their derivation in, in caricature. Spots became incredibly important. Um, you see a very high style French outfit on the right from the Royal Ontario Museum, Sam Spot. Uh, clashing colours, which have links back in time to ludic practices. Pink stockings, these come from Kerry Taylor auction, where she amusingly described them as either for a ver very large woman or, or a man. It's unclear. Wonderful co colours and movement is um, trim to move like a little bunny's tail as the man is seen from the rear. Wonderful shades of pink and green. Another rom piece from my time as a Jervis fellow. And um, finally, um, a long afterlife of, of, of fashion images and um, scenes of fashion. Uh, on the left is a uh, piece of porcelain from the Ariana collection. Uh, it's 1826, and on the right is a piece of Meissen. Not sure exactly what date, but I think um, mid, mid to late 19th century. Very strange image where uh, a courtier from the past has got these like enormous um, heart shaped things on their embroidery. So the long, the long 18th century created its own histories and historiographies regarding the invention of caricature and the spread of men's fashion. Um, and the, some of these uh, things live on in, in rather ossified forms and genres, such as porcelain figures. The love of the town becomes now a joke for future generations, but the male fashions of the macaroni period continued. Thank you.